Hi, Serene. Hey, Bob. How you doing? Very good. Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You're Serene Jones. Yes. President of Union Theological Seminary, where, by the way, I am uh, visiting professor of science and religion. Although I'm not actually teaching at the moment, but that is a, that is a title I have. Wow. And... You are, perhaps more to the point, we'll talk about union, but more to the point, you are the author of the book, Call It Grace. Um, I'm going to hold up, I've been listening to the audio book, so I can't really hold up the cover as would be customary. Is that visible? Yeah, there you go. There, they can see it. Call It Grace, the subtitle is Finding Meaning in a Fractured World, and that's what we're going to talk about. Is that, okay with, is that okay with you? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Really fascinating book. I've got to say you've had a more interesting life than mine. Um, I hardly think that's true. Uh, trust me. We will, this will be, no one will be denying this by the end of our conversation, Serene. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, in fact, uh, this is listening to books whose authors I'm going to talk to on this show is something I do sometimes and sometimes I'm always like leaving all these bookmarks in the book, you know, the, that you, as you can do with audible.com. In your case, it was so vivid. The stuff about your life was so vivid that, uh, I didn't feel I had to. I felt I would remember it. And, um, so we're going to talk partly about your life, but also about theology. This is, um, I guess, is there a genre called the theological memoir? I mean, you know, I guess Augustine's Confessions, maybe, but are there any others besides you and you and him in this in this genre? No, I mean, I wasn't trying to write this as a genre. It came out as mm -hmm. what I, guess I would call a theological memoir or a theology uh, book that's memoirish. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't the book I started to write. I was going to write about all these theologians with little stories from my life. And then as I sat down to write it, uh, I found I couldn't talk about the theologians without giving a broader account of different periods in my life when they um, were important to me. So it sort of accidentally became a memoir. Well, it works well. Uh, the, you know, there's a pretty natural intertwining of your life story with the theological contemplations and with, you know, kind of... Um, just primers on the views of some some fundamentally important theologians. Um, so let's start with, uh, let's say a little bit about Union, because you are the first uh, female president of Union Theological Seminary in New York. And if people don't know about Union, they should know that it really uh, holds a very prominent place in the history of American theology, especially liberal theology, which doesn't refer explicitly to political liberalism, but more about the, the, the nature of the theological interpretation. Although, as it happens, uh, people drawn to liberal theology tend not to be on the right side of the political spectrum. But, but anyway, the, um, so in the 20th century, there were a few theologians who made it onto the cover of Time magazine. And for our younger viewers and listeners, uh, being on the cover of Time magazine was the, you had achieved the pinnacle during the 20th century. Um, and uh, two of them were Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich, and both of them were at Union Theological Seminary. I mean, it, it was the place for liberal theology in America. Is that fair to say? Yes, that, that is a fair account um, and has been since it started, uh, almost 200 years ago now. Yeah, in the uh, 19, in uh, what, 1830s? 1836 was it? Uh -huh. Yeah, started and, and with Presbyterians. Um, it was a group of pastors from uh, some of them from New Haven, some of them from Princeton, who decided that the best way to train pastors was not to put them away in the quiet of the countryside, but to rather plop them down in the middle of a city uh, so that they could learn what it means to preach the gospel, the language they used at the time amidst the pressing needs of the world. That's the language in our charter. And it's really done that since they set up those tents and started teaching um, now two centuries ago. It's really been on the cutting edge of theology because it's put itself literally in the cutting edge place 
in the middle of New York City uh, in the midst of all of the world's controversies and conflicts. So there was a big emphasis on social engagement from the very beginning. Yes, yes. And, you know, actually, you, as it happens, grew up in a denomination that also put a big emphasis on uh, social, well, social justice issues, I guess you could say. And and given the fact that you grew up in Oklahoma, this might not have been predicted. Uh, you know, the average Oklahoman was uh, didn't probably have that kind of religious upbringing. But you you are an Oklahoman. Uh, in a pretty deep sense, what your great grandfather was a sooner, a sooner, sooners were the people who rushed. I mean, literally raced on horseback to, to stake out good land when the, when the federal government opened up the land, I guess, right? Yes, yes. No, my great grandfather, uh, was a sooner. Uh, so my family, uh, when the land was opened up, uh, were part of that original land run. And we still have that land in our family. And I start the story there. Um, I could go back further, but that's where I chose to begin the story because all sorts of the themes I want to talk about are sort of embedded in how that story unfolds in that place. Mm -hmm. Um, The the denomination was Disciples of Christ. Um, I could say a little bit about that. Uh, It was started out as a, uh, was called a movement and not a denomination uh, because the founders were very anti-denominational. They thought denominations divided people and the word of Christ should bring people together. And it was uh, very progressive, but it wasn't progressive because it set out to have a certain kind of political agenda. But their only uh, claim at the heart of their faith was no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. And they took this very seriously. And so they took the teachings about how to be a Christian in the New Testament very seriously. So uh, language about Jesus um, preaching to the poor and the captive um, and the orphan and the widow, uh, they took seriously. And this whole westward movement appealed to people who are on the margins of society because the Gospels speaks to that. And they subscribe to the doctrine of universal salvation, which mean no, means nobody goes to hell. Uh, whereas most Christians, I, I was brought up Southern Baptist in, in, in Texas, not, not that far from you. Um, and, uh, mainly in Texas, I should say. Uh, and the idea was very much that if you don't accept Christ as your savior, you are not going to heaven. But, um, and in fact, uh, you know, universal salvation is still a doctrine that I don't know how many denominations it's explicit in. Of course, universalist Unitarians are universalist, but a lot of people would say they barely qualify as Christian given their their kind of prevailing theology. I think uh, Catholicism flirted with universal salvation, maybe in Vatican II or something. I'm not sure, but yeah. it's still it's still a little radical, isn't it? It's um, it's radical more because people don't know about its history than it is to say in and of itself it's radical. Mm-hmm. It comes out of a long strand in the Christian history and in the Calvinist tradition of this tension that exists between the claim that uh, God's love um, holds true for us no matter what we do. Mm-hmm. We can't manipulate God with our works. So confessing Jesus is not a way to get God to love you and open the pearly gates to you. And there's always been this tension that it said all that is done in terms of our salvation is in God's hands, God's loving hands. And this other strand in Calvinism, which uh, points towards taking very seriously how you act in your life in order to be obedient to God. Um, So there, since the start, there's been this strand of universalism that says, unless you want to put the power for salvation in the hands of people, then you have to put it in the hands of God. And who is the God that we meet in Jesus? It's a God who loves everyone, uh, regardless of their quote, religious background. Okay. So we should talk. Pretty, pretty traditional strand in Christianity of this kind of universalism. It's not a new thing. Yeah, I mean, I guess it goes at least as far back as, do they pronounce his name Origen or Oregon? They're, 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 or I-G-E-N, I think. And that's back, you know, early, early days. So so the doctrine does have a long history. Yes. Um, the uh, Now, I, we should talk about Calvin a little because uh, he is one of the a series of thinkers who had a big influence on you. He had one very 
early. Um, before we get to him, I want to just quickly sweep past, uh, you know, uh, parts. Of, I mean, we talked about your great grandfather. Then you had these grandparents, one of whom, one grandfather seems like a perfectly nice guy. One doesn't. That's a whole story in itself. You know, I got to say in general, Serene, um, just yesterday, somebody who'd read my most recent book said, you know, I don't think I'd be comfortable being as transparent about my life as you were in that book. She said that to me. And I got to say, my book is nothing compared to yours. I, I, and I don't, I don't just mean, um, I mean, you're very, you're very open about things you've done that you deeply regret and things that relatives have done that you, you wish they hadn't, including your grandfather, even including your mother. Um, so I don't know if you want to dwell on the, the, I guess we should call him the bad grandfather of the two grandfathers. I don't know, but, but if not, we can, we can pass right on to Calvin. Yeah, well, he exemplifies, I mean, he exemplifies some Calvinist issues, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to write about my grandfather and about my mother, but also just write honestly about my life because one of the themes of the book is uh, the theme of sin and grace. And um, the theme uh, that I work out politically in the group is that in, in, uh, across the pages uh, is that in this country, until we're able to... Uh, take responsibility for our past and own it and claim it for what it is. It's very difficult for us to imagine a different kind of future. And in writing about my grandfather's racism in particular um, and the, his, uh, our family's um, likely participation in a, in a horrible lynching in 1911 in Okima, Oklahoma, um, I thought it was very important to do that because I wanted to say to uh, white people in particular, look, this is not something that lives in some mythical past. Um, it's the past that we carry in our stories and our bodies and our bones and our families. And if I'm not willing to dig into that white supremacist history, why should I expect anyone else to? Right. And there's a time in the book when you come across a photograph of the lynching in in that town, which I think is a town you grew up in as well, but and, and this is a time where when your grandfather would have been alive, and and pretty much everyone is it, it looks as if the whole town is gathered around and is celebrating the lynching, and that's the basis for your inference that he was at least probably not too unhappy about it. Um, yeah, it was in in this small town. He would have been six at the time, but his family was very large and very dominant in this town, and from the pictures. Um, the whole town of Okima, it looks, is gathered on the bridge um, going over the river over which uh, the body of Laura Nelson and her son are hanging lynched. Mm -hmm. So um, you encounter Calvin, I guess, as a teenager. We should say that your father um, was, uh, well, first an ordained minister, a, a, I guess you could say a theologian, and a professor and the, 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 uh, ultimately the president of a small college in Oklahoma. Um, so you were, you know, you were brought up quite exposed to theology. Um, and then at, was it a grandmother who gave you a copy of, of work by Calvin or something when you were a teenager? How did yes, that work? My, so my father's a theologian. I grew up talking theology at the dinner table. As soon as I could talk, we had to practice how to say Schleimacher correctly. The, the kind of the, one of the early liberal theologians, right? Is that that's the deal with Schleimacher? He's kind of the almost the beginning of a modern liberal theology. Is that fair? Yes, that's true. And and it was especially German theological name had to understand uh, the German roots of it. Um, but my grandmother, his mother, um, was a very uh, religious person, a deeply faithful person, but we had no formal training and. Um, when I was in college, she showed me uh, a copy of Calvin's Institutes that her father had actually brought in the wagon train with him from Pennsylvania when he came on the land run and settled on that early homestead in Oklahoma. Um, it wasn't until I got to seminary um, that I began to read Calvin in earnest on my own. Um, I just returned from uh, a year living in India um, and had been uh, struck for the first time in my life uh, by conditions of serious poverty and found in his introduction 
an approach to theology that just completely captivated me because that's who he was speaking to. Yeah. Now, Calvin, I, you know, when I thought of Calvin, at least before reading your book, I just thought of this very severe guy who believes that we are all sinners through and through mm-hmm. and should do our best to get a grip on ourselves. Yeah. Um, that. <laughs> he did believe all that. But you emphasize a different side. And this, I guess, leads us into a discussion. And maybe at this point, we should talk a little about the word grace. It's in your title. Um, but but uh, talk about the sunnier side of John Calvin. Well, the Calvin that I read is this guy who has a, always this double view of people. And that God creates human beings with amazing, as he calls them, glorious people. Uh, capacities for thinking, for relationships, for doing good in the world, for building great communities and positive societies, and for reasons that we don't understand, human beings, while they have this wonderful potential, over and over again, uh, choose to act against their best interest and against the way God has created them, and they uh, turn against God and sin. So that, that simultaneity of our goodness and our brokenness are always right there together. But Calvin was very um, hopeful about what it was that human beings, if they put their mind to it, were capable of doing in terms of a positive world. Yeah. Um, he did use the word depraved a lot, right? Or yes. <laughs> he yeah. thought we were depraved, which I'm okay. Uh, but, but there was, there was hope. And, and grace was important in, in the sense I get, I mean, well, first let's just drill down on that word a little. I mean, I guess, the uh i i would think that the earliest understanding of grace in christianity is something like you know grace is the the gift of salvation that god gives at least some people notwithstanding the fact that they are sinners is that right it, it it's uh it's an act of generosity of god's that is implied in the notion of grace right and then uh deliverance I, from sin, I guess, was originally implied. Is that all fair to say? I mean, yeah, grace put even uh, in a bigger context is the uh, universal love of God that it's called grace because we don't do anything to earn it. Mm-hmm. It, comes to us, um, it comes to us just as much when we're good as when we're bad. So it's not just a response to our need for forgiveness, although we do need that. But it's just the love of God in which lies uh, what I refer to as our ultimate destiny. Um, You can call that salvation. It's not just about whether or not you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. It's really about how your own life aligns with and is held in the ultimate destiny of the universe and your place in it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, with, in general, with liberal theology, um, it seems to me, you know, there is, I guess, more theologically conservative Christians might look at liberal theology and say, look, at this point, you're just basically new age. You know, it's just like your conception of God is so vague, you're, you know, and, and, you know, Tillich calls God the ground of being and so on. Um, So with that as context, I want to read you something I heard on TV just last night and, and, and ask you if it qualifies as a conception of Grace, it's in an explicitly New Age context. There's this show that was on for a couple of seasons um, called Enlightened. In yeah, I don't know if you've, have you seen it. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. So Laura Dern goes <laughs> to this kind of New Agey meditation thing to 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 get back on track and yeah. comes back. And, and there's this one um, scene where um, she so she has this experience on the retreat. She's like scuba diving or something. She encounters this giant sea turtle, and, uh, you know, she's been meditating for days, I guess, or something, but she later conveys this to her former husband, and she says, and it comes through in the course of it, that, that she's kind of thinking that this sea turtle was, was God, in yeah. a sense, in some sense, uh-huh. I mean, and was speaking to her, and she says, and she says, this was her takeaway, quote, this is all for you, everything's a gift even though horrible stuff happens. That's, now it's new agey, but I mean, that, does that capture part of what grace is, what a conception of grace is? Yes, that, that, that all that is and 
uh, we are each a part of it. I am a part of it. You are. All of it is a gift, um, and it is a gift from a God of love. It is, um, as I say in the book, love itself. Uh, it is the air, the water, the existence that we dwell in. Um, I also know, though, having watched that show, that one of the things that Laura Dern wrestles with, her character does, is she keeps thinking that when she figures this all out, uh, she's going to become perfect and her life will become um, more um, uh, more perfect, rid of all of its anxieties. And what she finally realizes in this show is that you can experience life as a gift and it's still rough and it's still hard and uh, and yet God's love is there. So it's, yeah. it's kind of very Calvinist show in the end. Well, this comes through again and again in your book. I mean, like many people, you run into hard times. Uh, so in high school, you had this, uh, this boyfriend who did not meet with your parents' approval. He was, uh, rode a motorcycle. Uh, he, they would have said, I guess he would have thought to be part of kind of the bad crowd in high school. He was probably not totally averse to taking the occasional illegal drug, although I don't know if you mentioned that, but, um, he was, a you know, hard partying, hard riding motorcycle guy. He, he, uh, your freshman year in college, he dies. He's gone off to work, make money on the oil rigs or something, right? Yes. And, and this was a big, uh, kind of a big trauma for you. Yes, yes, no. Um, and um, I tell that story because uh, that was a, a traumatic moment in my life that came just as I was leaving my own home and going to college and starting this with this sense of fresh hope and possibility and my boyfriend, uh, who came from the other side of the tracks, um, dies in a motorcycle accident, and I have to wrestle um, earlier than uh, we're likely to have the capacity to when we're only 18 um, with the differences between our lives and, and what it means that, that he's dead and I'm alive. Right. And you kind of realize... You, in, 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 in talking to his friends a little afterward, after the death, you realize how different your backgrounds are, maybe more fully than you had. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a, a number of things, some of which we'll have time to touch on. Uh, you had cancer. Um, you went through a divorce. All of this is in the book. Um, but it is, and then you're, you're, I, we may have time to talk about this, but your father has a very severe test of faith at yeah. the end, just so disoriented, uh, yeah. by what's happened that there's some question, um, of whether he believes in God. I mean, you ask him the question and for a time it's not so totally clear to you. Um, I guess, I mean, this is just, uh, this is a, well, it's just, I guess it's just a challenge for everyone. You must encounter it uh, as, as an ordained minister yourself. This must be uh, something you wind up talking to people about a lot, mm -hmm. right? Like, am I, mm -hmm. I mean, the theological version is kind of the problem of evil. If God mm -hmm. is really good and omnipotent, why is this happening? But how does that, uh, what are some ways that plays out for you as a minister? Yeah. I mean, I do encounter it all the time. I think everybody in ministry does. And if you're raised with a faith that tries to coordinate your own suffering um, with somehow a decision of God that you should suffer, then you're going to run into deep trouble because lie in the course of life, all of us confront things that don't go the way we want them to go, but also have to wrestle with very serious um, questions of human suffering, particularly when it happens to people that we love, sometimes even more than when we suffer ourselves. And, and where is God in all of that? Um, and I think for my father, um, one of the hardest questions for him was, um, as he came to grips with my mother's own betrayal, uh, he came not just to question whether God exists, but he began to question his ability to know things because he um, uncovered a lie that he had lived with for a long time. So that was not just a crisis of, God's existence. It was a crisis of how much can we trust what we know. Right. Faith falls under that as well. Right. Um, and I mean, what, yeah, it's hard at those moments. I mean, a big, 
You know, I was talking about kind of the new age version of grace. Well, you can go even further and let, set aside new age, just talk about kind of secular psychological therapy. And there's a big emphasis on gratitude, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there are in positive psychology, so and there are people who do gratitude journals, things I'm thankful for. But you go through times in life where it's be, almost beyond challenging to focus on that, right? Yeah, and if it's only, I, I am the first to celebrate uh, the place of gratitude in theology because I do think the fact that we're, that we even exist in the world is here is a source for gratitude. But a theology that just focuses on that simply denies the fact that there is a lot of things that we are not mm-hmm. thankful for mm-hmm. uh, that have to do with real hardship and loss and death and, um, and the list can go on. And that's what the theology that I'm grappling with this in this book is trying to do. It's trying to say, you can have a theology that doesn't require you to be all cheery faced all the time with gratitude, but can actually sustain you as you grapple with real pain. Right. And too much of an emphasis on a cheery face tends to um, not go hand in hand with a kind of a thoroughgoing quest for social justice. Right. I mean, um, th- th- there is, there is, uh, if, if all, if, if, if you say to everyone who's suffering, hey, have a stiff upper lip, things could be even worse, then you're not going to try to change suffering, uh, by and large. And you, uh, of course, Union is very active on the um, social engagement front, as I said. Uh, but you inherited that to some extent. Your father was active in the civil rights movement uh, at a time when not everyone in Oklahoma could say that. To the point where I think you have reason to believe your phone, your your home phone was tapped by the FBI, right? Yes, when I was uh, in junior high, uh-huh. my father uh, was involved in a school board campaign um, where they were running for the Dallas Public School Board, an uh, uh, African-American man, a Jewish woman, um, and a dentist. Um, and uh, it, was con- it was hugely controversial, um, and uh, we came under all sorts of pressure at that time from the John Birch Society and other groups in Dallas. Mm -hmm. the the far right i grew up with a very strong sense of the um the scary and really devastating uh presence of the of the far religious right huh partly because of your father's political activism Uh and um did did, did, by the way did, did he ever so I, I guess he was pretty much on board with your direction in life. I mean, not only did you become a theologian, uh, but you uh, you became a particularly socially engaged kind of theologian. Did he ever think you had kind of like your brand of social activism was had gone too far even for him? I mean, there is this generational thing. This happens sometimes because the definition of left keeps moving to the left. But uh did, yeah. Was that ever an issue? Well, we did when I was in high school and college. We would have some knockdown, dragged out fights about uh, women's issues in the church and mm-hmm. about LGBTQ issues. Um, he just didn't think that women issues were such a big deal as I was um, making them when I was beginning to understand feminist theology. And he thought, oh, the Bible can't support um marriage equality and can't support um, uh, gay ordination. And we used to have huge fights about it. I think over time, my father has become really supportive of my feminism and is one of the most outspoken supporters of marriage equality now. Uh, So that's been a change, but there have been times where we really Mm -hmm. butted heads and it was very generational. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you went to India. Now this happened, uh, you spent a year in India. This happened while you were at Yale Divinity School. You took a year off or w- remind me what, yeah, what the- my second and third year in seminary. Yeah. I realized that I'd gone straight from college to seminary and was getting ready to graduate and go into a PhD program and that I hadn't, I had not seen any of the world and I'd been, led a very sheltered life. So I took a year off and went to study at a small seminary in South India, Tamil Nadu Theological Seminary. So this was a time, I mean, I think now when people think of a college student going to India now, they imagine them going with some program. There's these other Americans. Everything's yeah. taken care of. If they if they get sick, they'll be medevaced out or something. You know? So but this was a very different environment. This was not, I gather, a campus that was accustomed particularly to having 
um, people from America, the, the whole kind of communications infrastructure wasn't there. And at one point you, well, two things, you, you get dysentery and you don't, I gather you don't really fully recover from it the whole time you're there. Is that right? I'm sick with it the whole time I'm there and I'm so stubborn that I won't leave in order to get well, knowing that as long as I'm there, I'm going to stay sick. The seminary was um, a seminary that almost the entire population of students and faculty were Dalit, um, which is the, un- the untouchable caste in India. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, the conditions were very, um, very simple. Um, and I went also to live in a village where it was even more simple than the seminary campus in the town of Madurai. Um, so as I got progressively ill, I found myself at a clinic that a friend took me to where the doctor told me the only way I was going to get better was if I left. And I said, I'm not leaving. And he said, well, I can't give you any medication because you'll just get sick again. And then he responded to my stubbornness by saying, well, now you're going to feel in your body what most people in India feel their entire lives. Mm -hmm. Um, And And you actually, go ahead. And that was a, that was probably the biggest I don't know, theological, social justice, educational moment, period. Um, mm-hmm. It's when you learn things in our body. Uh, you learn them in an entirely different way. Um, and you, you still suffer from the residue of that, I gather. I mean, it, it, occasionally you have immune system issues or something. Yeah, no, it, it was my immune system. I was sick for so long um, that it's just sort of my whole immune system doesn't do a very good job of figuring out what it's supposed to be sick to and when it's not supposed to be sick to anything. So it, it kind of exhausted my immune system and I've never fully recovered. Okay. So you were in a place where there, I guess, wasn't a telephone. You, you at some point decide to take a bus to, to a place where there's supposed to be a payphone. You get on the wrong bus. You, um, you find yourself uh, sitting at a bus station amid people who don't speak English, you have no idea how to get back. And you have basically a kind of a mystical mm-hmm. experience, right? I mean, you sit down, what, what do you think triggered it? Was it, a, was it a combination of the illness and despair? Or, or do, you have, do you have a theory? I mean, you sat, I don't know how long you had been gone. I don't know how long you've been sitting in the bus station, but do you have a theory as to what I mean, I guess you're a theologian. You would say you don't need some, some kind of biological explanation for mystical experiences, but uh, maybe maybe I'm talking too much like some kind of like, you know, uh, psychologist or something. But what is your – well, just just describe the experience. Well, I am, am on sitting on a bus platform in a town. I don't even know where I am, and night is falling, and I'm sick, and I'm getting sicker and sicker, and I have no – idea how to quote save myself and I think I'm going to die um and when faced with that um instead of fighting it I just sort of let go and um give myself over to whatever I think awaits me um and in that um moment with my illness um I'm consumed by this reality that if I died right there Nobody, my family would never know. And there was no one around who cared and no one would blink an eye. And, and having grown up in a, you know, a world where who I was as an individual mattered so much, I'm struck at what I think is the last moment in my life as, uh, um, the utter nothingness of my existence. Um, and I look up and see a man drinking tea. Um, as they do in India, they hold it distant from their mouth and pour it in. Um, I see him doing that with burning tea and wonder if his throat is burning. And then I see him, I want him to look at me, to acknowledge me, to somehow tether me to life. And when he finally does look at me, um, he shows absolutely no concern um, and turns and simply walks away from me. And uh, in that moment, I... Um, am opened in my own heart and mind to an entirely different way of understanding God and understanding existence itself. Um, that what does it mean to have faith if you discover you finally 
as you, Robert Wright, me, Serene Jones, don't matter. And that the stories that we live and what we tell ourselves about our ultimate meaning are just stories that we've conceded to, um, but aren't actually um, anything more than that. They're performances we've agreed to take on to structure our lives and give us meaning. That's such a terrifying thought, first of all. I mean, the thought of actually abandoning all that, you know, even though you know it's true, there's this story, there's this version of ourselves we carry around and we try to project that, and that's a big part of what we do in life. Mm -hmm. Um, But you were, so elaborate, you were, um, you confronted that, fact that that in a, it was a kind of not what buddhists might call a not self experience i guess in the sense that you were what? viewing yourself as a construction as an artificial construction yes. and then but but talk a little more about it in a christian context and 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 in terms of what what it said about your relationship to god yes so uh, it is. It was a very, uh, if you could put it this way, kind of Buddhist sense of no self. Um, for me, um, as I tried to understand it, I found the writings of Saint John of the Cross, uh, who writes about the dark night of the soul. And you find in these mystical Christian texts a description of of no self that comes um, when all of your uh, pretensions, all of the stories you tell yourself about who you are. Um, are stripped bare and and you are um, cut off even from God. Um, and that's one of the things St. John of the Cross says over and over again, is that the idols that we make out of God are the biggest and most devastating and, and all the consuming lies that we concede to. And that our lies about religion and divinity are the worst of them all. And until you can even let go of those lies, then you really have no idea what God is. So okay. to even let go of the lies of, of, of faith itself. Um, so yeah. it's like, a, well, that's not what negative theology is, right? Negative theology is just the idea that we can never say what God is, only what God is not, right? Yeah, negative theology can be very full of strong assertions. Yeah. Uh, this is a sense of just utter, um, the utter void. Um, and, and to find in that finally, um, what it means to be faithful, um, that, but, but that God is, is deeper and beyond and yet embracing of all. So to let go of all kind of, you might say, simple minded conceptions of what God is and your relationship to God. And yet somehow almost miraculously have a kind of faith endure. Mm Yes. Yes. And, and I, I mean, we're, it's in, we're in, we can't live without our ideas and our identities. Um, but you can have a certain posture towards them that comes if you realize they are constructions and you realize you're conceding to it. Um, and you're realizing that your concession is part of what it means to live a loving life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you nonetheless recognize uh, what kind of game you are conceding to play. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, as it happens, somebody from your... The, that seminary in India happened by, and you were saved. I was. Uh, yeah. And you can read into that what you will, I guess. Yes. But I was also saved by her and saved by the women in the dormitory who were just uh, girls my age who took care of me. And, uh, and they were Christian and Hindu and Muslim. And it was one of the most profound experiences of my life to have um, Muslims and Hindus. Um, praying for me and and doing rituals to help save me and being present to me. Mm-hmm. Now, a big theme in the book is forgiveness, um, and there are several vehicles for talking about it. People you don't feel like forgiving. Um, <laughs> one one of them is Timothy McVeigh, who did the Oklahoma City bombing. I think uh, was it your sister's husband who was actually injured in the bombing? You some one of your in laws was right. My sister's husband was across the street in the. Uh, why when the bomb went off mm-hmm. ran through the window uh, my sister's office uh, she's uh, a lawyer in Oklahoma still um, was just about um, a half a mile away um, and so uh, and we had friends and um, people that we knew that were killed and injured in that um, and so 
the issue here is kind of capital punishment. And you really struggle with it. I mean, you're really not happy with Timothy McVeigh, right? I mean, in your heart, you wanted him killed, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. And that's one of those, like, truths I'm willing to say in the book. I'm saying, look, I am um, against the death penalty, but to be opposed to the death penalty doesn't mean that as a human being, there can't be rage in me so great that someone who does acts of that magnitude of destruction, I as a person, don't have the desire to see them die. Mm -hmm. And yet I still think the state should not kill them precisely because I have that rage within me and wants them to, and want them to die. Mm -hmm. Um, The work of the state is not to enact our rage, but to constrain us to be our best selves. Okay. The, um, now forgiveness, uh, let me actually read uh, a little thing from your book. You write, forgiveness is the pivot that moves you from sin toward grace. It's that turn of the heart that requires that you face harms, transgressions, and hurt, and allows you to move forward to grace. Now, what's interesting about that to me is that, um, I mean, it seems to me the old-fashioned Christian emphasis on forgiveness, the one I grew up with, is God forgives you, um, and that's the most fundamentally important thing about related to grace, is, you know, that is the grace. God forgives you, even though you are a sinner. Um, and here you're putting, it seems, almost more emphasis on the importance of your forgiving others. And I don't want to say that that was neglected in my Christian upbringing, although honestly, I don't remember it being particularly emphasized, but I, I'm sure it was mentioned. But it seems to me you are almost flipping forgiveness in a, in a way relative to a, 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 an earlier, more conservative uh, conception of the fundamental role of forgiveness in in theology, and you're putting a lot of emphasis on our um, on our forgiving uh, one another, and it is in the Lord's Prayer, of course. I should say, for, uh, yeah, for, say. forgive us, forgive us of our our sins as our debts as we forgive our debtors, whatever it is. Yeah. So I'm not, I, I don't, I don't mean you made it up, but you're putting a lot of emphasis on that kind of forgiveness, right? Yes, I mean, for the ability to forgive others is ultimately and deeply tied to your ability to accept your own forgiveness. Um, and I, I try to tie the two together. But in my own life, things that have threatened me the most um, with despair have been my inability to let go of a sense of being wronged and my anger at the wrongs done to me. And they can become like a prison that... Um, isn't inflicting any harm on those you're not forgiving, but actually um, pulling you under into um, a dark cave of your own rage and your own inability to let go. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'm exploring. Um, and let me say, I think that grace, um, you always have to talk about it in two ways. Grace is the love of God and the forgiveness of God, which is always there constantly. Then there is our own lives in which we um, in more or less Um, with more or less clarity, open our eyes to it. And so it's not that by um, asking for forgiveness, God suddenly forgives me. God has already forgiven me, but it's really a question of how much in my own heart am I willing to let that love in and to believe that the harm that has happened um, is also embraced by God's love. But it's very important as I talk about forgiveness to not equate forgiveness um, with um, not holding people accountable, mm-hmm. but you need to hold someone accountable and make them, um, you know, um, do recompense for harms done um, or to change the environment in which harms were done uh, without uh, sentencing them to burn in hell forever or to rage against them for the rest of your life. Okay. So um, the book uh, you alluded to your, your uh, father's, um, having been betrayed by your mother, uh, and your, uh, it's a, it's a pretty powerful ending to the book. Now, your mother's, uh, you know, she shows up earlier, and earlier there are hints that, um, she resents being trapped, right? And, and she resents you for it as a, as a young girl. You're the oldest of the three, uh, sisters, is that right? Yes, uh huh. And, um, so you're getting a sense of it. 
And she alludes at some point later when you recall a specific incident with her. Uh, she says, uh, she alludes to crimes of hers or something, right? Yeah. Just vaguely. Um, so I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but it's so much a part of the, the book, the ending, and it's such a trauma for your whole family. Yeah. It's like it's like a crisis of faith almost for your whole family. Yeah, it is a crisis of faith because, as I say, faith is a communal thing, and when one part of it is ripped, the whole fabric tears, and everyone feels it. Um, so my mother, three years ago, after a long illness, uh, died of a uh, – they don't know where it comes from, but she um, – was diagnosed with uh, PSP, supernuclear palsy. And it was a very slow death. And in the last year of her life, she um, began to not be able to move and began to um, not be able to uh, control her impulses when it came to speaking and confessed to first to me and then to my sisters and eventually to my father that she had had an affair for seven years um, I was at college by that time, but my youngest sister was at home. Um, and it was with a, a good friend of our family. Um, and none of us had any idea about that. Um, so, uh, first when my sisters found out about it, we begged her not to tell my father. Um, but she told him anyway, and, uh, it was devastating for him. And it was devastating for us to watch what it did to him. And my mother never regretted it. And she pounded him with it. She pounded all of us with it. And um, Yeah, I mean, she, yeah, I, I would say in a, yeah, I, I, I mean, she's, she's, uh, she tells your father she doesn't regret it. Yeah. Uh, and kind of goes on, on about how much she loved the guy she had the affair with, right? Yeah. And wish she'd not married my dad or divorced him and been with him. And what was also so painful about it is she didn't just tell us, but she told all of the nursing staff at, at the, um, in the uh, nursing home. And then she told all the people from church. And then she told all her high school friends who lived in Oklahoma City. And she told anybody who would listen. So um, this wasn't like a family secret that we were had the luxury of keeping a secret. It was like a, um, a very public um, humiliation. Now, we should say the illness she had affects your brain, right? Yes. So it is conceivable, at least, that she would not have been behaved in such a seemingly cruel way, um, you know, had she in, had her wits about her, right? Yeah, I and mean, it's very hard to tell. I mean, we have no doubt that the story's true because the details were too specific. And, mm-hmm. um, we, and we found, you know, love letters and correspondences in her personal files that supported it. Um, you know, whether she would have told this had she not had this disease, um, I don't think that she would have because um, my mom was always very concerned about her public appearance as a sweet and good person, uh, which to many people she was. Um, but I also think that as my sisters and I often um, – joked with each other, if you can find joking in the midst of this, you know, it's a, it's a reminder to all of us that if you think you can take your secrets to the grave, uh, think again, um, because they often have a way of coming out regardless. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, work through these things in your life, uh, if you have a chance to. And she left my dad with no capacity to process it, no capacity to, to find a way forward with her. She just died. And they, so there was no closure. And he, you talked to him a couple of times. I mean, I'm sure many times, but in the book, a couple of times afterwards, actually about theology to some extent, right? Like, does he still believe in God for a while? He's not, not quite saying, I guess. But what, what, talk about what you took away from the conversations with him. Well, Partly I realized as he, as he, he stopped going to church, um, he stopped wanting to talk theology with me, which he'd always loved. I had to beg him to say anything theological. I couldn't get him to talk about his faith. Um, and uh, for me, part of it is a very simple fact that he'd always been a pillar of faith to me. And so it was very unnerving to me and my sisters to have this man of deep faith completely. It wasn't that he said, I don't believe in God. 
Right. He just said, I, I don't, I can't think about that anymore. Um, right. I don't have, I, I, my mind won't let me think about that. My mind, I can't go there. Um, so it was more a kind of despair than it was a rejection. Um, if I could do anything to the book uh, to change it, I would put in a very last page after the chapter where I end with my father's finally having a glimpse of theology in which he says, um, I ask him if God is love. And he says, well, yes and no, because even love is a word that's a predicate. Um, and God is not something that we can predicate. Um, but God is our ultimate destiny. Um, and I end on uh, that thought about God as our ultimate destiny. But I would put another page in that simply has in the middle of the page the words, Dad doing great. <laughs> <laughs> He has, um, you know, he'll never be the person he was before this, this fracturing of his faith. But he's, you know, he's able to uh, talk theology. Uh, he loved this book. I read it every page to him before I sent it off to the publishers. Great. Uh, but for him, it was very rejuvenating. Um, and he's doing good. That's great. Well, and, and, and he deserves a medal for being so forgiving of your mother. I mean, he's, he cared for her without complaint throughout this, I right? Know. I mean, she's, her mission in life seems to be to make him as miserable as possible at that point. Yes. And, he, and he's, um, he's, he's, he's walking the walk. I mean, you know, he, he has preached uh, forgiveness and love and it's an amazing demonstration of it. Yeah. No, uh, it was incredible to watch his, devotion to my mother and his uh, commitment to making her comfortable and being present to her as she was dying um, right. in the midst of his pain. Yeah. I mean, which is enlightenment. I, I mean, you know, if you can, it's easy to say, look, whatever people are, they to some extent became that by virtue of circumstances that I didn't share in and can't understand. And who knows how I would have responded and so on. It's easy, easy to say all that stuff, but then when it really hits home with this kind of power, you, you know, yeah. it's really hard. I, yeah. I, um, so congratulations to him. Congratulations to you for being his daughter. Is there anything else you want to say about the uh, the book? Um, no, it was very uh, rewarding to write it um, and to have a, a chance to tell these stories. And I'm just very thankful. My whole family um, and all the people who I talk about in the book um, who are still living had a chance to read it and give me feedback on it because I didn't want to write anything that would hurt anybody. Um, and I've just been overwhelmed by how supportive my family and the friends who are in it um, have been about the book. And that's just mm -hmm. that talk about gratitude um, that you could write a book this honest with the whole loving support of those around you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's a beautifully written book. Um, it was a surprise to me kind of because uh, some, of, some of the good writing emerges from you having so intensely lived the moments, it seems like they're, they're, they're so vivid and there's ups and downs and some of them are horrible moments. And I always think of you as being kind of unflappable. Maybe you can tell me that's wrong. I always thought of your, your, your first name as being appropriate because you do <laughs> seem to maintain a certain, I mean, being the president of any institution of higher learning is, yeah. has its share of turbulence. Certainly in, in your case, I, I know that there has been some, you talk about some of it in the book. Um, but, uh, so I was kind of surprised in a way that, you seem to internally have such ups and downs because it doesn't, doesn't really show. Oh, well, I'm not, I don't live up to my name very well. I think it's an aspiration, but not a, uh, not a description. Um, but I do think that underneath all of this, and one of the messages of the book is I really, I really am grounded in a, a deep and profound sense of God's eternal loving reality and presence in my life and um and i look around me and i i see um that that's not a common thing but the, the but the capacity it gives you to bear life has been remarkable in my own life mm -hmm. well it shows shows in the book shows in your life oh so thank you 
Congratulations. The book is called Call It Grace, Finding Meaning in a Fractured World, published by Viking. Yes. And congratulations. Thanks, Bob. And thanks for the interview. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye.